Planning for this loan began over two years ago, back in 2019, when I saw a post from the British Museum seeking partners to express an interest in hosting the Lampedusa, Lampedusa Cross as a spotlight loan. The team and I were in the very early stages of planning a programme based around the theme of migration. Central to this theme would be the public display of the Joe Cox Memorial Wall for the first time since the Batley and Spen MP's murder in June 2016 during the run up to the divisive Brexit referendum. The wall had been erected outside the House of Parliament and features the handwritten tributes of hundreds of people, including children. The wall had been transported to People's History Museum to be added to our collection and was waiting patiently in the museum store for the opportunity to be displayed. The wall and migration theme should have taken place in 2020, but the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously pushed it back to 2021. However, I feel it's very poignant that the wall be, will be on display over the fifth anniversary of Joe's death, which is in just six days time. Joe's maiden speech, we are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us, has inspired our more in common theme of activity to bring people together this year. PHM's approach to the migration theme was developed after an intense period of consultation involving one-to-one -one interviews, workshop groups, market stalls at events and open public consultations. Through consultation, PHM asked people what the word migration meant to them, what stories needed to be told and what the aims of the programme should be and who we should work with. A community programme team of five people whose lives have been shaped by a migration was created to steer the programme. It was clear the programme needed to highlight the personal stories and anecdotes that show both positive and negative stories around the topic. The consultation also identified a number of issues with the main migration is currently presented in PHM's main galleries including the complete absence of contemporary migration experiences, including the asylum process, the hostile environment and detention centres, and the need to highlight the long history of migration in Britain and surrounding issues, including colonisation, slavery and the Industrial Revolution. In response, a series of interventions in the main galleries were planned to explore these issues, as well as a display exploring the hostile environment entitled Hashtag Welsh Welcome, which sits directly opposite um, me here in these galleries. This planning had all begun before the killing of George Floyd and the subsequent wave of Black Lives Matter protests sweeping the globe. This backdrop has added pressure added to the pressure staff and the community programme team have felt to do this topic justice. Therefore, this spotlight loan and event doesn't stand alone in isolation. It is part of a much wider programme of events, exhibitions and learning activities that we hope you will be inspired to explore further. We intend our events programme to be the starting point of further conversation, discussion and debate. And I'm certain tonight's event will do just that in particular engaging with the many challenges and opportunities that migration presents for those who move countries, as well as those who experience new neighbours. I'm now pleased to introduce Hartwig Fisher, Director of the British Museum, to introduce the British Museum Spotlight Loan, Crossings, Community and Refuge. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this opening event for the British Museum Spotlight Loan, Crossings, Community and Refuge at the People's History Museum. I'm Hartwig Fisher, Director of the British Museum, and I'm delighted to be able to join you, albeit digitally. Migration is a topic we are all familiar with. It is one that is prevalent in the news across the world in its different forms. Thankfully, many of us are fortunate enough not to have experienced what it's like to flee your home to have to stake everything on a piece of wood, being able to transport you and your family overseas and to arrive often unwelcome to land that is unfamiliar. The two of these two powerful objects speaks to both the hope and the disruption experienced by refugees, not just recently, but throughout history. The Lampedusa Cross began its journey as a boat in 2013, carrying nearly 500 migrants from Somalia and Eritrea. There were far too many people on board. Fleeing persecution, they felt they had no other choice but to take this journey. 
Tragically, the boat caught fire, capsized, and sank. 311 lives were lost. The 155 survivors were rescued by the people of Lampedusa, a tiny island close to the coast of Tunisia. Moved by the plight of survivors whom he met in his church, the island's carpenter, Francesco Tuccio, made an individual cross for each person from the wreckage of the boat that carried them to the island. Acting as a mark of the survivors' salvation from the sea and their hopes for a future in Europe, away from instability and danger, the cross also sadly reflects on the fate of many migrants who do not make the crossing. Tuchu made larger crosses, one of which he gifted to the British Museum in 2015, simply made from two pieces of brightly painted wood fitted together. Complementing this poignant object is Isam Kurbaj's series, Dark Water Burning World. 12 miniature boats made from repurposed bicycle mudguards. <laughs> These boats represent the fragile vessels used by refugees to make their perilous voyages across the Mediterranean. Seeking to evoke the plight of Syrians these were made by Kobaj as a response to the ongoing tragedy in Syria. They carry a powerful emotional charge. This spotlight loan is part of an initiative by the British Museum to share the collection as widely as possible through our national program activity. We work with hundreds of partner organizations across the UK like People's History Museum to reach audiences outside of London. This spotlight loan will be going on to six further venues throughout the UK, thanks to the support of the Dorset Foundation, each display bespoke to that community. This display in Manchester will touch on the ethical and practical challenges presented by mass movements of people and on how Europe has recently responded to refugees and migrants. It is very fitting that Crossings is a part of the People's History Museum's current program, Exploring Migration. I very much look forward to visitors from Manchester and beyond experiencing these very special objects at the National Museum of Democracy. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. So a big thank you to Hartwig for that introduction to the loan. Um, we'll now move on to the next segment of the evening um, and I'll introduce the next two speakers. Um, Isan Kubaj was born in 1963 and comes from a background of fine art, architecture and theatre design. Um, he was born in Syria and trained at the Institute of Fine Arts in Damascus, the Repin Institute of Fine Arts and Architecture in Leningrad, Russia, and at Wimbledon School of Art in London. Since 1990, he has lived and worked in Cambridge, where he's been an artist in resident, a bifellow, and a lecturer in, at Christ College at the University of Cambridge. His work has been widely exhibited and collected, most recently by an addition to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Since, since 2011, Kubaj has, has been dedicated to raising awareness and money for projects and aid in Syria through several exhibitions, installations and performances in the UK and abroad. Isam will introduce his installation, Dark Water, Burning World and his other work. Isam will then be followed by Jill Cook. Jill Cook is head of Britain, Europe and prehistory at the British Museum. Jill has curated Living with Gods, Peoples, Places and Worlds, a history of, a world, of the world in a hundred objects and is a specialist in Ice Age art. Jill was instrumental in bringing the Lampedusa Cross to the British Museum, having been personally moved by a radio programme sharing the story of carpenter Francesco Tuccio. Jill will introduce the Lampedusa Cross and the work of Francesco Tuccio, touching on points raised by Isam, the issues these objects raise, the challenges faced by those who move, and the challenges this presents to receiving communities. Following Jill's presentation, I will facilitate a discussion between Jill and Isam, and I will bring in any questions from the Q&A. 
So please remember to post your questions and like any questions from others that you would particularly like to see responded to and posed in this discussion. So without further ado, I will introduce you to Issam Kubaj. Lovely, great. Thank you very much for this introduction. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate inviting me and my objects to, to your wonderful museum. Unfortunately, uh, we are all doing this online. I remember we were planning to do it live and the word exhibit, it is actually, it is something that is, we are all completely revisiting this word. So I will be talking about my object, but actually I would like to take you to the roots of this object. It is, uh, it's called dark water burning wall. And I would like to take you a little bit back to where or what kind of body of work that is, it belongs to. So can I have the next slide, please? How one could bring the destruction of the homeland, seeing it from distance, to the studio? This is a question that is always I ask myself. How could I digest what I am listening, I am hearing, um, and bring it to the audience in totally different context. So this is one of my responses. It's called strike. And I am burning matches, the amount of matches response to the amount of days since the Syrian uprising. And the amount, if you like, of matches being burned, you could recognize that is a, a nest being built, but that nest is being burned. So can we have the next slide, please? This is the first attempt for me to exhibit this kind of um, reaction to what's happening in Syria. This is 2013. And I um, decided to take X-ray images. And it was Syrian Mother's Day. And I decided to take this X-ray images to the dark room and make photograms out of them. And the whole exhibition called Excavating the Present touching on this idea that as many Syrian mothers has to collect body parts of their children to mourn them. And this idea that is actually um, that, that how difficult it is for somebody to be in this position not to mourn uh, your own child. So can we have the next one please? As many, as many children and adults and families were buried without any ceremonies. So this is a piece um, in uh, St. Peter's Church in Cambridge on the floor of the church and each book cover represent a anonymous person who um, was not being, if you like, in, in any way were, um, in any way was buried or any way was uh, mourned. So this is a piece called Unearthed. Can we have the next one please? Reflecting on the question of refugees in 2015 and 16, I made this um, miniature refugee camp made out of recycled material, papers and medical boxes. And I made um, uh, a fence around this refugee camp made out of burnt matches and exhibited them in five locations around London to reflect the refugee um, camps around Syria. And each time I go to this installations, I burned one match and install it as the, the ongoing count. And it's, this installation traveled to 12 locations. The last one, it was in Budapest in a refugee tent. So look at the refugee tent on the bottom left, where you could see the camp. It is, if you like, bleeding out of the refugee tent. Can we have the next one, please? Many children arrived with no air in their lungs. They were dead. They were arriving to many shores with nothing on their body except pieces of, of clothing. So I took this idea of pieces of clothing and made a gravestone written writing on them in Greek and in Arabic unknown and exhibited them in different locations. This location is in the Classical Archaeology Museum in Cambridge. As you are seeing, I'm not actually taking through the journey of these through chronological thing. I'm just telling you the background of this body of work I am working with. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, 
again, talking about refugees, I took my Syrian passport, which was canceled, and I canceled it again. And I exhibited it as part of um, an exhibition of reopening of Cattle's Yard. And I took a copy of each of these um, uh, pages and canceled it and exhibited on the wall. And in the end, if, if you like, there is a destruction of this dream. Underneath this uh, image, there is a, another stamp I am stamping on the wall called, I will be here, then canceling it. Toward the end, I took the word canceled and chopped one letter in the end. So the word can becomes the word, the word canceled becomes the word can. And that was a, a positive reaction towards the end of the exhibition. And then I collected these copies and made a book out of them and I exhibited in action two. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, here is a journey of just a background of what kind of things I have done relating to the Syrian crisis. And what I have shared with you is just fragment because I really would like to build up toward this, if you like, this piece. This piece started in 2017 at the Fitzwilliam Museum. I saw this very beautiful uh, sculpture, uh, boat made out of lead with three goddesses. So just, just if you analyze the, what I just said, lead goddesses, this is 500 BCE. Um, Syria used to send to the, to the Mediterranean goddesses, not refugees. And I, when I approached the museum to actually put them together, I was in collaboration with a poet, Ruth Badel, and you will see her poem in, in the right, which I will not attempt to, to read. But I just wanted to, to say that it's actually, as you just heard, that these boats are made out of mudguards. So the mudguards is part of the concept. Now, can we have the next? I decided to make thousands of them. So this is one of installation in King's College Chapel, where actually I covered the floor or the altar um, floor with thousands of them. And this was the eighth anniversary of the Syrian uprising. Can we have the next one, please? Now, um, Jill and I met um, just before this exhibition, just a few months before this exhibition, and I was delighted to work with Jill on this installation where the, the cross and the boats were working together as the last thing um, you see in living with God. And this was quite a very, very powerful thing for me to see that is, this is the last memory where um, if you like, the religion is supposed to link us together. Suddenly we are actually working on, on this issue that is separating us, which it shouldn't be. Uh, we should uh, somehow celebrate our differences rather than let it be um, a barrier between us. Can we have the next slide, please? And I took this boat to different locations. This was exhibited in the Venice Biennial in 2019, where actually I had this performance daily. I take my boats to different locations in the, in the city and uh, photograph them against different parts of the city. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, to my, um, to my surprise, and what a huge responsibility, in last Christmas, I was hearing the, the program it's the history of the world and a hundred object. Um, that is my, my boats became 101 objects. Um, it is a huge responsibility to make this historic document as such, but I am delighted and I am delighted that is in this very humble material, I could reflect on the pain of many. Can we have the next slide please? Can we have the next, okay, wonderful. Currently, they are actually in, um, in at the British Museum. They are exhibited as part of reflection uh, relating to contemporary art from the Middle East and North Africa. And it is actually, um, I am looking forward to seeing them. They are, the exhibition is until August. And I am really uh, looking forward to see the, the, in what context they are going to speak. Can we have the next one, please? Now I'm running towards the end of my presentation. They are currently, I just came back from Amsterdam. They are in a huge installation made out of the installation called Scaling the Dark Seeds, Mo Sands, Moons. So the big boats reflecting the 
the months since the Syrian uprising, 122 votes. Uh, the middle boat reflecting the weeks since the Syrian uprising and the small boats carrying small seeds reflecting the days since the Syrian uprising. So three different ways of counting time since the Syrian uprising. And it is a, it is a, it is a huge installation. I really highly recommend visiting this installation. Can we have the last one? Please? My last slide. I know it's not, I'm not talking about actually the boat, but in 2017, I was invited to the Penn Museum. And again, another installation I put to do with Aleppo soap. And I decided to revisit the idea. And I, I have currently at the Fitzwilliam Museum an installation called Don't Wash Your Hands. Um, I will leave you to read the rest of it, but it is to do, I really, to do with I idols from Syria, but I really, it is a cry from me and from many others not to forget and not to wash hands of Siri. Thank you very much for listening. That was fascinating and touching. And uh, I also want to add that it's a real um, uh, pleasure to be presenting this and sharing this with the People's History Museum. Uh, it's just really what we wanted. Uh, National Museum of, of Democracy, uh, the association with Joe Cox, and I'm really thrilled that uh, we can give these objects agency through working with you and to uh, try to work a little uh, against uh, what Pope Francis has called the globalization of indifference. Uh, I collected the cross following uh, a wonderful uh, broadcast by the BBC journalist uh, Emma Jane Kirby. Uh, after this uh, terrible tragedy that uh, Hartwig referred to in 2013, when there was no rescue service in the Mediterranean, there was nobody to go out and assist people drowning uh, and suffering terribly in the water. And the people of Lampedusa were absolutely on their own. It's a tiny island, uh, few inhabitants and no resources. And yet they, in those early days, uh, did their best to assist people to rescue them. And Emma Jane went back in 2014, not to um, comment on the political situation or uh, criminal people smugglers or uh, the uh, aspects of, of the refugees and migrants themselves. She went back to see how the people of Lampedusa were faring, the islanders themselves, and what it had been like for them. She took it out of the, the, the politics and the, the crime aspects. And in a very moving uh, broadcast, she uh, spoke to the optician who had been at sea on the night of the 2013 disaster and at great risk to uh, his own life had got as many people as sure as he could. Uh, he talked to the grave digger who previously, this tiny island, idyllic little island, he'd only had to bury one person every few years. And suddenly he was faced with hundreds of bodies to deal with and no mortuary. Uh, the women of Lampedusa, and it was the women, uh, who cooked up kilos of pasta to keep everybody fed. The priest who uh, tried to give counsel and pastoral care to people who had lost everything, including many members of their families. And also, to Francesco Tuccio, who sadly uh, doesn't speak English and couldn't be with us this evening, uh, but uh, 
Francesco is Lam Lampedusa's carpenter and he met Eritrean and Somali refugees uh, taking shelter in his church and he was just overcome by their plight and he didn't know what he could do for them. He's not a rich man, he has no political power and so he used the talent he had, his carpentry skills, and he went to the seashore, he picked up wood from the boat, and uh, as you can see on his bench here, made little pendant crosses for each person. Um, as very poignant souvenirs of what they had come through, uh, as well as something to say, you survived, you have hope. And the refugees were uh, really terribly pleased to accept these. When the Pope visited uh, Lampedusa to say a penitential mass, he, Francesco made a chalice and plate and, and crozier for Pope Francis. And Emma Jane's description of all this made me realize that here were objects in a hundred years time the British Museum will be trying to look back at this period and we need objects to tell stories and for months and months we've been trying to deal with uh, issues and stories around the the continuing crisis and because these people are destitute, they have nothing in the way of material culture. They were difficult to, to represent. And here listening to the program, I realized that there were objects and objects that we could put in the museum to uh, start stories about the plight. Um, in a lovely poem by Nicholas uh, Murray in his anthology, The Yellow Wheelbarrow, he describes the cross as its arms outstretched to offer comfort to the wave washed driven to the shore. And it's, that's a beautiful way of expressing the nature of the cross, which is made from the, the wood of the, the uh, broken up uh, fishing bob, boats, which on a holiday in the Mediterranean would normally delight us, but here carry uh, this, these terrible tragedies. But the cross also outstretches its arms to uh, people like the people of Lampedusa, like the people of Lesbos, like uh, people living in Southeast Europe and all the way across Europe, who have also had to come to terms with the arrival uh, of new people, of finding ways to give them sanctuary. And it's another reason why it's so marvelous to be working with uh, Manchester as a city of sanctuary. And, but for those people, their identities, their ways of life have felt threatened. And that's not a bad thing. It is a difficult thing. And we have perhaps not always been uh, entirely appropriate in the way we have dealt with their part of the discussion. We've rather tended to say that they are perhaps unfeeling, even bigoted, and that's not helpful. What we need here and what we hope these objects will bring to people's history uh, and Manchester generally is a conversation uh, very much in the spirit of Joe Cox. Let's find what you, unites us, what we have in common. And yes, it is very difficult to be in the housing queue that you may have lived in terrible housing in Manchester for 30 years and the person behind you has just arrived from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Eritrea. 
that's a tricky thing to deal with. And we can, mustn't dismiss those things. We must avoid indifference to both sets of people and understand how to take arguments forward and how to bring resources to, to sway the politics to uh, a, a, a better view and a more humanitarian view of these terrible crises. Um, it still goes on. Just yesterday in the paper, uh, a small child washed up on the shore of Norway as a consequence of uh, a sunken boat in the, in, in the English Channel. Terrible loss, terrible tragedy, it's day after day. We mustn't be indifferent to this. We must find ways not to put it at arm's length, as has happened with Lampedusa. Lampedusa is now uh, a, a militarised border on, uh, on the southern, distant southern part of Europe, where Europe and uh, Britain can keep this problem at arm's length. EU and all of governments of Europe have singularly failed, who have singularly not been capable of addressing the issues involved. And so we hope that through this exhibition, we will find ways through poetry, through song, through discussion, to uh, think of uh, better ways of dealing with crisis, of ways of drawing in those who do have power and those who do have resources to understand that there is a wellspring of people who want to change a very serious situation. And I'd just like to finish what I have to say uh, with some um, uh, lines by Warsan Shire, who um, has Somali parents, was born in Kenya, and is now an activist and rather brilliant poet in, in, in Britain. And in her poem, Home, which I do recommend you find on the web, she says, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And that so echoes with what Islam has said uh, about his dark water burning worlds, his boats, and unites a, a very wide uh, experience through the refugee community, which it is up to the rest of us to respond to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Jill and Issam. It was um, very moving, particularly the words from the poetry that you've just shared there, Jill. Um, I've just been checking, we don't have any particular questions posed um, to you both, um, but I thought we could open it up into um, a discussion for the next 10 minutes. Um, is there anything that um, Jill has raised, Issam, that you would like to respond to in the, any of the points she's um, raised regarding receiving communities or the role that museums, objects and artworks can play in contributing to, to this debate? I was really very moved to hear the way how Jill has this this beautiful way of of um, putting her argument in a very simple words, and I I really feel touched by the way how you ended up with these poetry in the end. That is definitely nobody will go to the water if they have actually um, any. Um, reason to think that is actually the the land is safer than the water the water is for many people as far as i know from syria water is not actually a an, an easy place not familiar place because it, um, we have a quite a huge land and uh, one one section of syria is facing the water um, but i was really very pleased to to see the way how you put your your thoughts about the, the cross being an arm. I found that is a very beautiful image. I would like to come back to that. I thank you for this. Um, but it's equally very nice to see the way how you are sitting in the galleries actually uh, next door to the cross and um, the, the boat. It is, it's really great to see 
I don't know how big is this gallery. I don't know what is there, but I'm really looking forward to see the conversation. It is a conversation between the cross and the boat, between the other object in the gallery and in the boat. Um, but I am um, I'm really looking forward to see what uh, what else you have in mind. Um, if you will have any question for us so far. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. losing my headphones. Um, I think um, my main question was around the, the role that museums and objects and artworks can play um, in there. And I think particularly in this gallery, I think this intervention is really, um, it, it's, it's filling a place of, in the consultation that we found that migration is absent from the galleries. Um, and I think it's something just to describe where we are in the galleries at the moment. Um, we're in the we're in main gallery two, um, which ends really in sort of 2010 um, when the museum galleries opened. And through our consultation, this is where we really found those migration stories, Brexit referendum, Scottish referendum, all those things are missing from our galleries. Um, and I think having this intervention here opposite the welcome exhibition, which is about um, the hostile environment. It's a really a way to spark conversations in our galleries about what's missing and what we need to do going forward, because we're very aware, um, you know, our, our current galleries are completely inadequate about migration. We have a small section in the 1950s um, about um, the um, Windrush generation arriving. And that's where migration is told here. Um, and so we're very honest that it's it's not okay. And that if we were to have a gallery redevelopment, um, that's very much what we would address. And I think, but that is the thing with museums, you're never going to ever have a perfect gallery because everybody's constantly reevaluating history and questioning. And that's that's what should be happening. Um, so through the programs that we have here at People's History Museum, um, we've had, um, well, our next programme will be around disabled people's rights and activism. We've had programmes around protest, about, around LGBT plus rights. And all, I think it's, it's having those debates and using that learning to inform and not just, you know, not defend almost the displays you've got to really question them and interrogate them. And I think for me seeing the cross, I'm, I, I it's really moving to be able to sit right next to it here. Um, and I hadn't actually realized that Francesco Tuccio's signature was on the back until today. And I think that's so moving to see that on the back and to sit next to your boats here, Sam. Um, for people who were, who were on the call, um, do come in and look at them closely because you really can't appreciate them unless you're sat right next to them. The, the matchsticks um, representing people in the boats and the, the way that they're positioned, it's just it's just so moving and powerful and, um, you know, them representing the people in there. And I think this is what we wanted with this intervention in, in the galleries for people to question at the migration stories we tell um, and to feed back on what's missing and what more we can do. So I think... Um, Sorry, I've not read, that's not really a question. That's just a statement about, about this work, but that's how we feel yeah. this work is. Um, Jill, sorry, Jill, did you want to respond? Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes, I, I, I do, because um, the wonderful thing about um, having uh, worked with Issam over these last three or four years uh, has been that aspect of, of co-curation. It's been about bringing together experience and, and uh, curation and... Uh, various aspects of uh, the, the predicament that we're in. Um, I might also just ask, um, well, I, I would also just say about Francesco, um, he's a very simple man um, and uh, a, a wonderful carpenter. Uh, and also I realized a very wise man Mm. Uh, because uh, when I asked him if he would make a, a, a cross, if, if the museum could commission a cross from him, he said, oh, I never dreamed that would happen. Mm. And he made one and sent it and wouldn't even let us pay for the postage. He posted it. I mean, curator's nightmare, wooden object <laughs> in post. Um, but it arrived safely. And he began to do this with many institutions. 
And as the object came through the museum doors, it started to gain agencies, just as Issam's um, installations have done, that the fact that this became uh, the last object to be um, acquired under Neil McGregor's directorship, everybody expected him to have something uh, hugely magnificent and expensive by a top artist. And what went on to the front of the newspapers was a wooden cross with a simple carpenter's joint. So that was that was wonderful. We've had it again. We've had his Sam's boats gaining agency through history of the world as 101. But by doing uh, what he does, um, Francesco has sent crosses to churches, cathedrals, art galleries, museums. And every time he does it, when it goes through the doors, it tells a story. Um, it often makes people weep. And that's <laughs> it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and through that, uh, it brings to us our personal responsibilities and um, a way of, of working against indifference. And it's really interesting that museums can play this role and also be safe spaces for people to have what are very difficult conversations about identity, religion, poverty, resources. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really, uh, as I say, um, I first met a really simple man and then realized he was actually a very wise man. Like Thank, you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. But it's equally, if I may just carry on the thought, it's exactly what you are saying. That is, it looks a very humble piece of wood. And it's actually just that agency that gains the minute you know where it's coming from. Suddenly it becomes much bigger than itself. I have seen it. And I remember actually when we were when we were installing that I really thought it was much bigger. I really felt but it is just having that kind of, um, when you come close to it and you know that these pieces of paint witnessed or actually contained many sounds of tragedies. So these pieces of wood has, has inst within themselves, the, within their DNA, suddenly they have a different kind of um, message they are sending. And I really agree with you that is, I really would love to meet. I mean, I remember you showed me some images of the graveyard of the, all these boats that is, he will collect his pieces of wood. It's just. I think that, we've got that picture actually. We might be able to see that. I would love to see that because it just seems to me this is exactly where is his wisdom coming from. That actually he did not see the destruction. He saw the opposite. He saw something I could do from that destruction. I could send exactly. them. Exactly. I could send a much stronger message than this destruction. It's a very painful thing to see what, what we are seeing here. But what, to, to do something very positive, something hopeful out of that, I found that this wisdom definitely is very evident. And it's really privileged to have my boats next door to his piece because the conversation between, between them, they are, they, are, they are different in scale but it's equally they are sending, hopefully that they are sending the, the kind of message that is we need to discuss. Yeah. Um, what, what we were just talking about, museums are not collecting objects, but they are collecting objects that is reflect in our histories. And our history is a very painful history currently, and we need to reflect on it all. I mean, it is regardless of our subject. Look at this wonderful carpenter with his very humble tools, what a message he is sending. Um, just just picking up from that, um, Isam, I've noticed that we do have one question, which we'll just take this one question um, and then we'll move on to the music segment. Um, I'll just put this to Jill and Isam just for time um, so that we can then move on to the um, performance. So the question um, from Samantha Beasley is at a government level, there are many bad policies regarding immigration and refugees that are cruel and amount to genocide. From Britain, Europe, Australia, etc. Does the panel um, agree? So, if I could just ask that to Jill um, first, and then to Isam. 
please. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, uh, many things happening at the moment that are cruel and unworthy of us. I have to express that as a personal opinion and not as a museum opinion, of course, in the current climate. Um, but that is my personal opinion. I think it is cruel and unworthy of us. Um, I think it's not peculiar to us. It's a worldwide phenomena. And perhaps as an archeologist, I ought to add that throughout the history of uh, human evolution and human time, um, people have moved uh, and moved in hope usually uh, and settled and mixed um, genetically. This is a very healthy thing. You can't, um, you need to marry out uh, to remain genetically healthy. So migration has been something which is, first of all, people of the world then as territories and politics and, and, and possessions uh, become priorities. Um, and from those things you, get, you take identity, migration starts to become problematic. And we have to find humanitarian ways to get through that and to keep up the conversation uh, to um, obtain better policies. I mean, policies that exclude children from, uh, orphan children from being uh, allowed into the country. Um, policies that criminalize people who have done nothing more than want better for their children um, seem to me to be uh, uh, unacceptable. Um, uh, I hope you'll have many interesting conversations at the, at the People's Museum about these things. And if I actually may follow, that is, I have visited two islands, the Isle of Butte and the Isle of Lesbos. And I have talked to these refugees myself. It was very, very painful to see the way how they express their disappointment after making this journey all the way and suddenly Europe is closed. Europe is nowhere for them. I found that is actually, um, I will, if I may just say one, one story about this, um, in my recent exhibition at, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, I made this performance where I took a shoe of a child and actually I cut the sole out of the shoe and many police borders took this action to, to stop this whoever attempt to seek a better life, um, not better life, actually life away from the bombs. I mean, they are not just coming for the sake of, of fun. There is a tragedy behind these stories. And when I just see, I am just hearing that Lampedusa is now a military place, where is actually a defense against the, these coming people, as these coming people are enemies. They are, they are us. They are. They could. We could be easily in their place. We could be easily in this position one day. And especially with this pandemic, we recognize this actually how fragile we are. And I think the policies of these people in the government, whatever government it is, it's very easy to sit in, in their offices to think of policies, but real life is much more complex than that. People don't leave their homes for the sake of it. They leave... Well, sorry, Jill. Yes. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, Issam. But, but it also comes back to what I, I was saying before. This isn't just about talking to politicians who think that they're actually doing what people want because people are afraid for their communities, for their identities, uh, when numbers of people uh, uh, arrive and, and have all sorts of, 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 of es essential needs um, and they feel themselves, you know, very pressured by that. And, you know, almost all of them, if if a refugee knocked on their door uh, in, in distress would say, come in and have a cup of tea and would be person to person sympathetic, but their fear. 
for you know because perhaps they're not themselves economically um, in a in a good position or because they don't want their communities to to change. I think we also have to address that, that these policies sometimes come from the fact that we're too afraid to talk to everybody about it and to understand everybody about it. Yes, uh, the new refugees have very, very pressing needs, but you know, so do some people who were born and brought up in this country. It is a it is all about um, proper distribution of, of, of resources and, and caring about everybody and not putting anybody above anybody else but, and dealing with, with issues, not um, dividing people by referring to them as bigots and so on. This was Jo Cox's message and um, may we honour her. I think that, that's a, oh, sorry, I'll just have to bring the discussion to a close there um, so that we've got time for the music performance. But I think that's a really poignant moment for you to end on, Jill, echoing Jill, echoing Joe's um, words. And there's just been a comment in the um, chat from Rachel Shah saying, here, here, there needs to be more cross-community empathy. Where are the examples of how we bring communities together? Um, and I think that's one key thing that we've been working with um, the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, there's the great get together events and that we've had a more in common group meeting at the museum and there's many more in common groups around the country. So those are some of the examples, but um, by no means all of them and, and ways, you know, we, we definitely need more of, of those examples of how we can bring communities together. If you are able to visit our more in common exhibition, um, you will be able to see some examples um, of the um, of um, some of the work that has been done by um, some of the more in common groups that we worked with to develop that exhibition. Um, so I just thought before we move on to the music performance, I also did just want to touch on um, what you said in relation to the emotional response to objects and to um, aspects of the galleries. We have, since we reopened, experienced lots of visitors, especially finding um, the seeing the Joe Cox wall on display, um, incredibly moving. And I think, you know, um, you might ask someone, oh, did you have a nice time at the museum? And actually it's not necessarily about having a nice time. It's about having an experience, Absolutely. developing, learning something new. And I think, you know, um, we might, a, a trip advisor might say the museum made me cry, but actually that's the response that we that we want to, we want, want to have. And I think that's one of the things um, that you've said but it's really interesting what you said, Jill, that we need to deal with these issues, not just call people bigots. And hopefully through um, through these discussion and debate that we can provoke with this programme, um, we'll be able to do that. Um, but we could we could discuss rage, but we better move on to you and um, performance. So thank you very much, um, Jill and Issam. Um, just as a, the next performance um, from you and McLennan um, is around 40 minutes long, and then we will bring the event to a close um, at the end. Um, so just to introduce Ewan, um, Ewan um, went from being BBC folk artist to his work with Transatlantic Sessions and he's come to be known as one of the finest troubadours, singer-songwriters and balladeers of his generation. Whether singing self-penned works that speak to our modern times, centuries-old traditional ballads or drinking songs, his intimate, intimate and moving performances are renowned for their ability to weave narratives that span centuries and continents. As well as some of our of the favorite, uh, as well as some of the favorites from his previous albums, his solo performance will feature tracks from his forthcoming album *Borrowed Songs*, with works that touch on issues from Windrush to the loss of our natural world, as well as traditional shanties, lullabies, and ballads. And I think you will find it incredibly moving. In between each of his um, pieces, Ewan gives his own narrative um, of the song. So hope you enjoy this performance and it gives you an opportunity to, to reflect on all the issues that we've discussed. And we'll see you for a close in around 40 minutes time.
is there for honest poverty that hangs his head and all that. A coward slave, we pass him by, we dare be poor for all that. For all that and all that, our tiles obscure and all that. The rank is but the guinea stamp, I am amongst the gout for all that. Though on him live here we dine, where hard and great and all that, he fools their silks and knaves their wine. I am man's a man for all that. For all that and all that, their tinsel shone and all that. The honest man, though he's a poor, is king of men. Yon perky pot a laird, oh, I struts and stairs and all that. The hundreds of worship, that is word, he's but a coof for all that. For all that and all that, the ribbon star and all that. The man of oh, independent mind, he looks and laughs. A prince can make a belted knight, a marquee duke, and all that. But an honest man's a boon his might, a faithy man for that. For all that and all that, their dignities and all that. The pith of sense and pride of a higher rank. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that. The sense and worth for all the earth shall bear the grief for all that. For all that and all that, it's coming yet and all that. That man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that. Hello, and uh, good to be with you here. It's, uh, that was a song by Robert Burns, a song called A Man's A Man, or Is There For Honest Poverty? And hopefully some of the sentiments in that song will resonate with the, the theme of this show, Exploring Crossings. And it's a privilege to be, to be part of this, and to be linking up with the People's History Museum. It's a theme, this one, an issue that couldn't be much more pressing. And I'll play you a few songs now, uh, over the next half an hour or so. Some of them are traditional songs, traditional songs from the British Isles. And some of them are songs that touch on issues around migration and movement, that kind of thing. This, this next one is a song that I wrote a few years back and I wrote this song at really at the height of the 
the, the crisis, with the refugee crisis, when almost daily we were having on our TV screens these awful scenes of people fleeing from conflict zone in Syria and trying to find a safe haven in Europe. And this is a kind of song that I wrote in, in response to seeing these events, but also on reflecting about the, the, the wealth of songs that we have within our tradition here in Britain about migration, generally about emigration, and about the songs that focus on how people have been forced to emigrate, often Scottish and Irish songs over the centuries, because the life that they faced in their own home countries were, were just intolerable for whatever reason. And, uh, and the songs that we have in, in, our, in our repertoire, in our tradition, tend to deal with, with these people who are forced to emigrate with great sympathy, with great compassion, and uh, they, they, they detail the plight of these people and the, the loss of their homeland, the loss of the country that they, they know and love and uh, the plight of those people ending up in a, in a place they often don't know. And it was thinking through that tradition and that repertoire that I, uh, I wrote this song. It's called Lampaducer. the cotton bundle to my back and gripped the hand that hauled me on the deck There we were as the waves rolled to the sun There we watched the dusk come falling down The engines kicked and they roared us out to sea Shoulder to shoulder, my brother and me. One hundred huddled souls turned their gaze. Watch the only land we known slip away. Nights we made our way, a piece of driftwood thrown on by the waves. At night, the stars pierced the deep blue sky. The memories clouded in behind our eyes to the green days of youth. wound its way down to the sea When the sun dipped and the swallows called us home And the shadows and the bullets took it all rose up out the mist We cheered the pale shore with trembling fists Man, woman and child hope and fear The strange ragged rocks were drawing near They watched us throw our bundles over Board and wade through muddy waters to the shore. 
They watched as we lay gasping on the sands. Strangers adrift in a foreign land. They watched as we lay gasping on the sands. Strangers adrift in a foreign land. Strangers adrift in a foreign land. Strangers adrift in a foreign land. That was Lamp Producer. Here's a tune that I kind of arranged over the course of lockdown. And it was a tune that kind of kept coming back to me and I, before I really knew what the tune was, I'd kind of come up with this arrangement. And it was during that first lockdown, as the sun was shining, and I was sitting out the front of my house with neighbours around that I came up with this. There's one you may have recognised, Amazing Grace. In kind of thinking through what I wanted to play for this show, I've been racking my brains to think about, about songs, not just ones that focus on contemporary events and uh, the, the, what's going on at the moment in the world, but songs also that dwell on the past and the issue of movement and forced migration and so on in the past. And this is one that is, uh, is kind of of that ilk. It's a song called Rufford Park and it's one that's kind of been taken into the, the traditional canon of folk songs in the British Isles.
And it takes us back to the middle of the 19th century. And it was written shortly after this, it was thought, but the events that took place here were around the middle of the 19th century. And it was a time during which the, 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 the process known as the enclosures were kind of coming to an end. And the enclosures had kind of taken place over perhaps as much as a couple of hundred years up to that point. And it had been the gradual forcing of people from their land, from the places that they had often lived for many, many generations. And uh, it, it, often it was deemed more profitable for landlords to, to clear the land and to give it over to, to sheep farming and, and commercial activities. So people were pushed off the land and, and this particular uh, event took place uh, just outside Mansfield in the north of England. And it's, it, it involves the kind of encroaching on the lands of local communities, the lands that they had used to poach. And the poaching that they did on these lands was a, was a kind of vital supplement to the, to the food that they were able to get hold of. And so these lands were important to them for, for poaching, for, for timber, for firewood, for that kind of thing. But as these landed estates began to expand and began to push back against local communities, uh, these kind of conflicts began to arise. And this is what this song describes. Really a, a big conflict, a big fight really between the poachers on the one hand and the gamekeepers, the keepers on the other hand. And the local communities, the poachers, put up resistance to being forced off the land. But the consequence of that is several of them are hauled before a judge and sentenced to transportation. And so this is a, this is a song that tells that story, a true story. It's called Rufford Park Poachers. Upon 
the ground with a mortal wound at Keeper Robert's Lee. He never shall rise up again until the judgment day. So put as bold as I unfold, keep up your gallant heart. Think about those poachers bold that night in Rough and Park. Of all the band who made a stand to set a net or snare, the four men dragged before the court were tried for murder there. So poach as bold as I unfold, keep up your gallant heart, and think about those poachers bold that night in Rough and Park. The judge he said for Robert's death, transported you must be. Serve a term of forty years in convict slavery. So poach as bold as I unfold, keep up your gallant heart, and think about those poachers bold that night in Rough and Park. So poach as bold, the tale is told, keep up your gallant heart, and think about those poachers bold that night in Rough and Park. Rufford Park. This next one is a lullaby, and it's a, a song called Kuri Doon. It's a, a Scottish song, written by the wonderful songwriter Matt McGinn. And it's a kind of bittersweet song, it's a lullaby, a children's song really. It's a miner singing their child to sleep and telling the, the stories of what they experience in the mines. Kuri Doon means to kind of cuddle down or to burrow down, it can mean both. A miner's lullaby. Oh, my 
darling For this evening we win Curidul, curidul, curidul My darling Curidul the day Curidul, curidul, curidul My darling There's darkness to the main, my darling. Darkness, dust, and damp. But we must have our heat, our light, our fire, and our lamp. Could he do? Could he do? Could he do? My darling, could he do the day? Could he do, could he do, could he do, my darling? Could he do the day? Your daddy, could he do, my darling? And the free foot scene. So you can could he do, my darling? Could he do and dream? Could he do, could he do, could he do, my darling? Curry Doon, a miner's lullaby. This is a song that I wrote a couple of years ago, this next one, and I recorded it on the latest album that I, wrote, that I uh, produced. And it's a song that I wrote in response to the Windrush scandal that erupted a couple of years back. One which I think shocked the nation, shocked many people. And this is a song, again, which kind of tries to almost set that contemporary event uh, with a bit of history to it. And rolls it into the form of a, of a kind of traditional song in the National Archives, you can you can go back through the passenger log of the of uh, HMS Windrush, the boat that was the first large post-war kind of uh, emigration from the Caribbean. And this is a song that is is loosely based on the details of of a couple of people that I found there in that logbook. My name is Joseph Gallagher, I am 88 years old. I came here on the wind rush, a young man restless and bold. 
I watched old Kingston fade away, a suitcase by my side. My mother's face was wet with tears, but her eyes they shone with pride. They told us we'd be welcomed here, that good work would be found. So I headed up to Birmingham, took a flat in the east end of town. I got myself a labouring job, and I worked every hour I found. My head back then was full of dreams, my feet on foreign ground. But the work was always heavy, and the wages always light. And as a young black man in Birmingham, well, you soon learnt how to fight. But my neighbour showed me kindness. I was welcomed as a son of their own. And in just a year of living here, it began to feel like home. Though it seems like only yesterday, that was fifty years ago. Now my children have had children, and I'm proud to watch them grow. I helped to build this city through the good times and the tough. I helped to build this country, now I'm told that's not enough. Last week, one night, a knock came. There were two men at the door. There were boots and there were battens, they were dressed for bloody war. They asked me for my papers and they said I could not stay. Deported was the word they used, five thousand miles away. When I think back on my life spent here, in this country, in this town. Well, it's kindness and it's decency that everywhere I found. But it's clear that those who make the laws lack all humanity. So it's up to us to start to build the world we want to see. Windrush. Well, I'm going to finish off with this song now. Thank you very much for listening. A big thanks to the People's History Museum for for putting this show on, for put, placing this spotlight on this on this crucial theme, and for for having this exhibition, this wonderful exhibition that I I suggest you all take a look at uh, in the museum there. I'm going to finish off with this song, and it's a song of the travelling people from the north east of Scotland. There is a rich tradition of songs and poems and stories from the travelling people, really from all over Britain and beyond, but particularly in that part of Scotland, in the North East, there's a long tradition of travellers. And this is one of their songs. It's a drinking song, it's called Jock Stewart.
drink anyway me I'm a man you don't meet every day I'm a piper by trade I'm a Roman young blade And it's many I'm a man you don't meet every day Well it's often I've sat with both bottle and friend Is there a man could ever ask for more So be easy and free when you're drinking with me I'm a man you don't meet every day Let us catch well the hours And the minutes that fly Let us share them so we'll While we may So be easy and free When you're drinking with me I'm a man you don't meet every day Come fill up your glass With whiskey or wine And whatever the price I will pay So be easy and free When you're drinking with me I'm a man you don't meet every day So be easy and free when you're drinking with me I'm a man you don't meet every day Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>